Well, catching fish in a lake is one thing. Catching them in a river is something totally different. And I don't see many youngsters river fishing anymore, not like I used to 40 odd years ago, but hey ho, what state are many of our rivers in? Not what they were 40 years ago. I'm gonna take a look at some clips I took with a tiny little handheld camera, just a little handheld one, I walked around with the wife, got some pictures, and then I'm gonna show you some interesting stuff at the end, a comparison of then and now, because I am so ancient from the 1960s fishing, I can remember just how good some of the rivers were. Now look at this beautiful summer shot of a river here. There's panning across there, a lot of streamer weed in it. Now I can just tell you, years ago, I'm talking say 40, 50 years ago, there was nothing like the amount of streamer weed and slower growth weed in the rivers that there is today. It's just the way it is. Whether it is nitrate runoffs, we don't know. This angler's just there fishing in the margins. Now, just take a look at how overgrown this is now, because I might be able to find pictures, hopefully from one of my books, that shows you what the place looked like before. In a river, you have to find the fish. Now look, there's a spot. Just close in there, there's a bit of a shaky camera. Can you see the fish down there? They're at the back of the streamer weed. The streamer weed grows with a root at the front, and then just think of long flowing mermaid's hair, but in green. So in other words, there's a canopy that they can get up underneath. And the fish will very often lay at the back of the canopy, if you like. Now, if you want fish like barbel, you've got to go to the middle pace of the river where there's more power coming through, if you like. And also look for margins. Can you see there's a, there's a nice gap over the back there? You're looking for different parts. Here's a, here's a place, now you can't fish this spot exactly just there, it's a, a day ticket place, I think they do salmon fishing there now. Years ago it was absolutely ran with fish, and you can well see why. Because it's below a pump house, there's a lot of oxygen going in there, and of course all that makes really good fishy conditions. And you've got streamer weed down the back, but years ago the streamer weed wasn't in the middle, the streamer weed was on out either side. There was a gap down the middle that you could catch the fish in. So there you can see, think of an oxygenation pump on your live bait tank. Look at it, it's absolutely powering in there. So a good spot to look for on any river is, let's say below a weir, because you've got a high oxygen content. In comparison, above where they take you know the water through the sluice, you can see it's very slack. This was a big, roach stretch, I mean like two pound roach it used to be now, but look at, can you see the different weed growth on the bottom there? It's a different weed growth. And really, that was never there years ago. This is the sort of thing you want to see, is where are the small fish, where are the minnows, where are the fry? It's an indication that the river, you know, is in good shape. And to be honest, the rivers nowadays, I see less and less and less of the small fish. I don't feel it's a good sign. And also the flow. There were never lilies on this stretch years ago. There were never big, great, big choked up stream weed there years ago. There was never real proper water plants growing straight out of the riverbed. I fished this for roach 40 years ago in the winter. That was, you could run a float through there for pound to two pound roach. I mean, there were some really good fish in there. Now you couldn't run a float through there. It's choked. There is indeed a fish here, you probably won't see it guys, but it's it's just laying underneath. Now looking upstream, there you see a smooth. There again is a weir at the top of this river. This is a Hampshire Haven, and you can see two sluices pumping water through the weir. Now, you can catch fish right in the fast weir water, but generally a slower stretch, you know, where it slows up, I find is a little bit better. Now here, on that particular shot there, Again, there was never the amount of stream of weed. Now just look at the rushes. Look at that tree in the middle by the railway swimmer. That was never there when I used to fish that in the late 60s. It was not there at all. It's where sediment has deposited, uh, you know, let's, let's call it sand, soil, whatever you want. And then something takes growth, a reed, a rush, then maybe a bird drops a seed, something like that. And then along comes a bush and the bush turns into a tree. So the only spot you're going to get fish, see that narrow channel there, that's an ideal spot to bait up. I caught my first barbel about where that lifeboat is, just hanging there by the corner of the bridge many years ago. Too many years ago, I was 14 years old, so over 50 years ago. 
the pace there was much, much faster going through there. Predominantly, that would be Bubble and Chubb. And in the corner there used to be a place for Big Pike. And I mean, seriously, Big Pike, 30 pounders. Looking upstream, that island on the right was never there. So way downstream, these guys are lucky enough to um, fish in what a section they call the bridge pool, which is mostly, I guess, they fish here for sea trout. And these two get anglers are just probably float fishing down there. Maggots, brandings, usual sort of thing going down. I just see a float there. Um, just take note of the swans, though, guys. I take note of the fact that the swans are there. Here are the fish. Lots of small fish there. Now, I'm going to say, show you why are the small fish there. When the anglers out in the boat, didn't seem that they were catching too much. And yet here there's small fish. Along the side there would be a good place to try if you're on rivers like that for, let's say, perch and pike. It's a natural reinforcement area they put there. But those pilings are very good for, hopefully, catching perch. Small fish shelter there and the perch and pike will go in there as well. Upstream of that particular bridge you can see, totally different stretch of river. It's not quite so fast. Because it's so slow, because again, the flow's not coming through, I feel there's less fish there. But again, you can see where the guys are. Look where I'm standing, right on the edge of the bank. Plenty of fish close in there, milling around. So obviously they would probably take maggots, I would guess, something like that. But why? Why are they there? Ah, oh, that's because people you know, feed the swans there. And these fish obviously learn that as well. So take note, guys. Don't always moan at people feeding swans. I'm not particularly a swan lover by any stretch of the imagination. But of course, if they got bread going in on a regular basis or duck feeding, there's a good chance the fish are actually going to be closer to the bank than out in the boat. Here, years ago, was much, much more pace on this particular piece of river. Over on the right, there was a great big bay. You can see all the rushes have overgrown there now. This is another type of problem. Another very big pike spot there, 30 pounders. But the bay has gone. It's just disappeared. There's a trickle coming through there now. And you can see the bushes overhanging in the side. So what it's all about, I feel, is flow on rivers. I'm just generalising. It's not just this river, it's many rivers. And you can see, looking back up there, vast beds of streamer weed. Now, what they used to do on some rivers uh, is to get in there and, and cut it out manually. And then you get spots like this, you see, where you've got gaps, you can actually get some bait going in. Underneath that tray, uh, tree there, I've caught pike. It would be a good spot for perch as well, possibly chub. Uh, but again, you've got to search out the fish. You've got to look for features in the river. It's not like a lake that's stocked where you can just pile a load of bait and you know they're there. Now that was a nice little summer shot there that uh, you could see. But the problem being, what happens is, this is, I've seen this over the years on many, many different rivers, small rivers, streams, big rivers, like you saw there. You don't get enough flow come through. The sediment settles on the bottom in the gravel, in amongst the stones. And then along comes a plant. It could be stream of weed initially, but after a while it will be reeds, reed base, clogging stuff. That clogs the river. So when you do get more sediment coming down, it clogs it even more. So then they've got something to get their roots into. They spread and spread and spread. Now, years ago, that would happen on a very small scale. Along would come a huge winter flood, rip it all out, clear it, scour it, and you'd be back to normal. That doesn't seem to happen anymore because that weed and that sediment is so embedded in the rivers, it just stays there. It doesn't get blasted out. That's what I find in my experience. Other river fishermen, by all means, put some comments in there, in there if you think different. I don't think these rivers get scaled out like they used to. But recently we had a big flood go through. I'm not saying it scaled it out. I'm pretty sure some of the islands and reed beds are never going to get scaled out. They need digging out. But look at the contrast in the flow here. So this is the River Thames at a place called Pangbourne above Reading. It is a raging torrent after several days of rain on wet ground. You can see, look across there, the main sluice gates are open. It's just ripping through. Now, it used to be a big tree there, see where I'm pointing? And I lost a pike at least 30 pound there on a spinner. And it was nothing for us to catch in that slack there, in that eddy. Anything, 10, 15 pike a day on spinners, dead baits, live baits, whatever. And it is still an eddy because look at the foam 
uh, in the background you can see the log there which goes round and round in circles even in a flood so that would be the only place I'd want to fish in flood water conditions across the back is an island it doesn't look like an island it looks like the trees are growing out but I used to catch chub just to the left of that boat where that island is to, you know between the boat and the house is a bone dry island that's now covered in flood water but the chub used to be either side of that on this sluice I used to anchor it in there, obviously not in these conditions, in regular river conditions, uh, catch brown trout, catch bream, perch, chub, and there's another island, look, completely swamped, completely swallowed up, and I can't say it's all global warming because we had floods years ago, but what I'm saying is we don't get the consistency of flow through the summer when we need it. What we do here is we get the river flooding like it does, but how much actually soaks through to the underground aquifers. And what happens when the river does get going is we have what's called abstraction, which is when, I guess it's the water balls one assumes, that takes the water out legally for towns, uh, other building developments, and we get less and less water. This is well and truly flooded. But why I just want to point out there, if you look at those ridges like you get on a beach, that's where the tide uh, leaves marks in, a set, in the sand as it comes up on a beach. It's the same here. The sediment there, the rings there mark the level coming up and the wavelets uh, coming across it, it gets washed depositing and that's the sort of silt that's going to get deposited in, in the river and held up. Here's a couple of guys having a paddle boarding session in a major flood going towards a weir at speed. Now, I might not be the brightest tool in the box, but that strikes me as not perhaps the best thing to do. So I certainly wouldn't advise that. Look at the speed it's going under this, and there's a big steel grill there, a grid that's trying to stop logs jamming up uh, in there, I guess. The power of this river is actually sort of, it bows or, or humps by those buttresses. You can see the rubbish that's collecting there. An incredible volume and incredible power going right through the whole of the river system. Even the actual weir seals itself are totally swamped. It's running through everything. Thankfully, the guy's realised about the current. Look how he's struggling to paddle back against this flood water. So at least, thank goodness, they are going to get out. There is a lock uh, that they can go through further down. But um, thank goodness they had sense not to get anywhere near because the speed picks up. Look, a 40 gallon oil drum just washed and jammed against there. They would have had no chance whatsoever. You could get fish along that slow bit there, perch, when this finds down after about two or three days. Most of the time with floodwater fishing or rivers, you'll do better as the river starts to find down from the flood. So generally this would be totally unfishable. Here's about five, six miles further upstream, another island that is land between there and the house it's total land, it's gone. The main river's coming down the middle to the left. If I pan across, you'll see all that scum on the surface and there's a lock. So you can get day tickets on there, I do believe. I wouldn't want a day ticket on this particular day, but you can see what else is there. In that eddy, that slack, there's going to be fish for sure because the seagulls are there. The rubbish is circulating, it's going around. Look at the size of that log. It's a circulating motion, so any food might drop down there. And exactly, that's why the birds are there. They're looking for any bits and bobs of food. I think those are, well, would they be black-headed gulls, immature black-headed gulls? Now, who knows what this bird is? Yes, I know it's a duck or a goose. I don't know, a pink-legged goose? Because somebody must have spray-painted those legs. There's the footpath, just to show you how far the River Thames has come up here and burst its banks. It's gone barely, well, the footpath's gone, it's disappeared totally. It's just about to swamp over that bridge. And if I zoom in there, you'll see, boom, that's how far up over on the riverbank is going around that chair. And you only need about 12 inches of water, fast flowing water, to knock you off your feet. Looking left, there's a little slack there. It's even going up the road there now. So flood water conditions, when they're extreme like this, not even, me personally, not even worth fishing. But just like these birds, hang around, wait and see what happens. And after a couple of days, you know, it might drop. Now you can see here, those birds are waiting for people. Again, people feeding off the bridge, bread, that's what they're there for. So don't forget I said 
earlier on to watch out where people do duck feeding, bird feeding, because you never know there could be some fish in there. And if any bird does get below the surface, oh, here comes Pinky again. Pink beak and pink legs. Somebody tell us. It's a beautiful coloured one. Somebody tell us what it is. Is it valuable? Has it escaped from a wildlife, wildlife park? So you can see there the lock is much, much slacker. Um, so that you you will be fishing downstream from that where the uh, water's slower out of the main flow. And there, obviously, the guy, the lock keeper, is checking on that flow because he has to regulate gates up and down on all rivers. This is all rivers. The best place to fish is what they call a side stream or an offshoot river like this that comes off the main flow. You can see, yes, it's still flooded, but it's absolutely fishable, even under these conditions. Slightly coloured, you want a bait like a worm or red maggots. Down along the bottom, look at the speed that the bubbles are going. It gives you a good in indication of the flow. Now, all very interesting stuff, but I've been around a long time, been fishing those rivers quite a long time. 50 odd years or so. I, I can't tell you how good it used to be years ago and basically it's not now. It's the volume of water going through that I feel is one of the problems. Yes you could say there's pollution, there's otters, there's all the sort of, there's crayfish, there's whatever and they're all rivers all over UK there's going to be a problem. It could be fertiliser nitrate runoff from the um, uh, uh, farmland, there's loads and loads of stuff but I feel the main thing is the lack of flow where it's being sucked out for towns and new builds and it's just reducing the flow and that creates an environment that's probably not conducive to river fishing. So the river fishing is getting harder. Um, you may be think, well that crazy old guy, what is he talking about? Well, I've got a picture or two to show you of an exact spot that I fished 40 plus years ago and I want to show you how the reeds and the rushes encroach even on the main stretches of the river and if it's not sorted out it just creates more barriers, more silt. So check this out and this is a before and after picture if you like. Right here's that river in the summer, lovely. Look at the rushes on the top right hand corner. I'm going to freeze it. There's a bush on the left, rushes. Now I'm going to go to a picture at least 40 plus years ago. Look at the bank there. Can you see the difference? No tree in the water, no rushes along the edge of the bank. And there is a guy, a friend, fishing there. So you can't get away from that, can you? Let me just show you the two pictures there. Rushes growing in the middle of the river. It's the same shot, it's the same piece of river. Totally overgrown on the right-hand side of the green picture. Look at the top black and white picture. Beautifully manicured bank. It's, a, it's just a bigger river, it's a bigger river altogether. Now look here. There's where I talked earlier in the flood water, up on the Thames where I used to go pike fishing regularly. And there was a tree stood there uh, over on the right. Look at this black and white picture. You see where the caravan is? This may be 45 years ago. It's not in flood, but if I pan left, there is the giant tree that used to grow down in the water. So I do not speak with forked tongue, guys. I'm telling you what these places were like years ago and what they're like now. That river was really, really good to fish then. It used to be a day ticket, and I used to go up there and, and take a small 10-foot dinghy up there, put it on, uh, on my roof rack or over inside a van, and there I am, hooked up to a fish. And that is exactly the same shot as a flooded one I showed you 40 years previously, even using an old reel. Looks like a closed face reel to me. Now look at this old shot. This is a really old one. This is on Throop Fishery on the Dorset Stour. They used to get in there, Glen the Bailiff, and get a big scythe and chest waders and manually cut gaps in the streamer weed so anglers could fish. They don't seem to do that now. They're just happy to let it all choke up so the anglers can't get to the fish or whatever fish are left. If they did this, I think it would be much better. And there you can see how clean is that gravel, that gravel run there. And that's what you want to see. Look, that's what's there now. There's silt, you can see the silt laying in the gravel, the floods don't seem to scour it out. Years ago, this is a black and white picture taken by me, you can see the beautiful clear gravel almost as, looks like it's been scrubbed by a machine. Look in the background there, there's that salmon hut, and look at the wonderful chap on the right, fishing away there. I used to go regularly down this river, fished there a lot in the late 1960s. 
I couldn't get enough tackle. The mix fishing was so good, you took all the different rods you could. And if you look there, you'll see there's a lot of close face reels there, which were all the rage at the time. We used a Fabrine, Barbel, Chub, uh, Roach, Dace. Um, using a fly rod there, did some fly fishing as well. So an old black and white picture there, guys. It just gives you an idea of how good it was fishing years ago for mixed fishing. So it just goes to show you, doesn't it, how you can get the before and after pictures. Now I had something like, at one stage, 20,000 still pictures in my library. Photo library because I did so much writing for magazines and books. That's all done now. Um, it's now moving pictures rather than still pictures. I wish I kept some and I wish I had my old diary to go in and show some of these pictures of the before and the after. Because it's like, it's not like a piece of instructional history. And if you showed it to people, I'm sure the powers that it would be, if you say, that's what it was like 50 years ago, that's what it's, it's like now, there's a vast difference, a vast difference, and that is reflecting on what is in the river to catch. So, you youngsters out there, if you do go to rivers, and you have a tough time of it, and you probably will, don't get too despondent, because they take a lot more to learn about, to get to know where the fish are and which are the swims that are good and which are the swims that are looking good but a total waste of time. I'm sure in the river scene there will be people that, you know, other anglers that might help you out and point you in the right direction with tackle techniques and everything because there's something about fish in a river that's really quite satisfying. I don't know if it's the noise, the environment you're in or what, but I do like the river fishing. We're probably never going to get it back to what it was anyway years ago, but that look, what's the same 50 years ago anyway? Nothing, is it? But I just thought it's worth showing you. If I can think of it, I'll probably go through some of I've got 16 odd books I've done, and see what else I can find that might be of interest to you, and show a bit of before and after of different places. Of course, the same goes for beach fishing as well. I've got some beach fishing pictures. Oh, they make me feel sick now. Oh my God, the fish we were catching. Not now, though. Anyway, that's just something to keep your minds occupied for a little while till we can get out fishing. We'll see you guys in the next episode. Hopefully, got a few, well, a few fish. I need a big fish. I've been locked up with this lockdown for so long. I've still got hair to pull out, luckily. I'll be pulling out soon, guys. I'll probably go fishing. See you next time.